Well, good evening, and welcome back to Airmen and Space Warfighters in Action, where our Air and Space Force leaders share their unique insights. I'm your host, Orville Wright, president of your Air Force Association. And today, in fact, this evening and morning in Osan, Korea, I'm excited to host two great airmen, Lieutenant General Scott Poyce and Chief Master Sergeant Philip Hudson, talking to us today from Osan Air Base in Korea. And of, cor of course, you can only hold events like this with the generous support of our sponsors. So thanks to Collins Aerospace, Elbit America, General Dynamics, GE Aviation, L3 Harris, Lockheed Martin, Oracle, Pratt & Whitney, the Pentagon Federal Credit Union, Raytheon, the Roosevelt Group, and SAIC. So a great thanks to all of, uh, all of uh, our sponsors for your commitment to our airmen and our guardians. Lieutenant General Ploys is multi-hatted and serves as Deputy Commander, U.S. Forces Korea, and Commander, Air Component Command, United Nations Command, as well as Commander of the Air Component Command and Combined Forces Command, and finally, Commander of our 7th Air Force and Pacific Air Forces. Chief Master Sergeant Hudson is the Command Chief Master Sergeant for 7th Air Force. General Floyd and Chief Hudson have a hard stop this evening uh, on uh, at 45 minutes into the hour. So I'm just gonna go ahead and return the uh, stage over to them for your, your remarks. And so thanks again. Hey, thanks a lot. Uh... Orville, we really appreciate it. Um, and uh, I would also like to say thank you very much to all the sponsors of AFA. Um, you know, the, without your sponsorship, we wouldn't be able to put on events like this. Um, and as soon as we get back to what I would consider a little bit more normal, uh, a little less COVID, uh, we look forward to getting back in person with you all uh, back at the AFA conferences that are held each and every year, yeah. something we look forward to each and every year. Absolutely. Um, and also, I would also like to thank AFA for, you know, setting up this uh you know, COVID friendly uh, way of doing uh, some 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 talks from the folks. Uh, your intro makes us sound like we're awfully important and, and, and you know us better than that. that. That is just not the case. What we have the opportunity to do over here in Korea, though, is, is to work for about 10,000 airmen each and every day and try and make their lives a little bit better, uh, try and make uh, our alliance a little bit stronger uh, and just try to make our families, uh, our airmen and our guardians uh, feel that they are empowered to uh, to take the fight north if we need to. Um, we are really, really excited to to get a chance to talk with you all today. Um, for those that have, you know, somewhere in your biography said you were in Korea, I'm here to tell you it's not the same Korea that it was when you were here. Uh, depending on exactly where you were, whether you were at Osan or Kunsan, you were down at Kwangju, you were up at Suwon, uh, you were down at Daegu, uh, I'm here to tell you that this place has really changed over the years. Uh, we have uh, we, we we experience a quality of life that's absolutely unprecedented, uh, and it actually remains one of the best places to serve on the planet. Uh, you know, Seventh Air Force and all the other hats that we get a chance to to be a part of is really all about making sure that we deter, uh, we defend, and we defeat any attack from the north. And, and that is really based on, you know, the alliance that's been here for over 70 years. The Korean alliance is, is one that's actually, you know, uh, built and, and drawn with blood. Uh, we had Americans that, that, that came to a land that they did not know, and they, uh, you know, put forth their lives alongside of our Korean counterparts to defend South Korea and the Korean Peninsula. And that ironclad alliance is absolutely alive and well today. I, I would argue in, in the three times that I've been here, and I know Chief's been here a few times as well, uh, I've never seen the alliance stronger than it is today. Uh, we, we've definitely seen some huge, uh, you know, some, some huge challenges over the last year or so with COVID. But, you know, uh, we, we, we talk about an ironclad alliance. Well, I can tell you it's also a COVID. Uh, you can't break it with COVID. You can't break it with typhoons. And you can't break it with rhetoric. Uh, the, our alliance is absolutely you know, strong, stronger than it, it has been in, in, in probably the, all the time that I've been here before. Um, and part of that is really our ability to focus on the mission. You know, this is a place, if you remember, that you are in a deployed setting 
with a real threat to the north, an armistice in place, so by definition, a war is still ongoing, and you have the opportunity to bring your families. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about that a little bit later. But it is a, just a place that allows, I think, our airmen and our guardians to truly focus on the mission in a way that I don't think other places do. Uh, you know, when you deploy over to the Middle East, a lot of the folks over there are on a rotational basis. So they're there for, you know, maybe a few months, maybe six months, maybe a year. Well, when people come here, they're here for a full year if they're in an uncompanied status, two or three years if they stay, if they come with their families. And so what that does is it actually builds a little bit of continuity and it truly allows our airmen and our guardians to focus on what the real mission is, which is to fight tonight. And fight tonight is not just a saying, fight tonight is really just a way of life. It is. Yeah, so sir, I, I, thanks again, uh, General Wright. It's, it's great to see you again and, uh, and a shout out to our, our chairman as well, uh, our Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, uh, Murray. Uh, I remember the last time we, pre-COVID, obviously, the last time we were all together, you kind of give some of the command chiefs around the Air Force some inside baseball on that, that uh, Chief Murray was coming on board to be our next chairman. So uh, uh, I've kind of seen that happen. Unfortunately, we've had to do it remotely mm -hmm. and, and in a COVID-friendly method. But uh, what a great team to have General Wright and Chief Murray uh, leading our AFA. And from a lifetime member of AFA and a current MIG Alley chapter uh, uh, a member, uh, I want to thank you for your leadership out there, sir, and thank you for the opportunity for some General Ploys and I uh, to kind of comment about what it means to be warfighters in action. Uh, I agree, our bios make us sound really cool. Uh, I'm not sure that you know we're the cool cats really uh, on the peninsula, but it is the airmen and the guardians that we lead that that are absolutely make it a, a pleasure and, a, and a, to wake up every morning and, and to serve in a leadership capacity with them. Uh, yeah, talked about fight tonight, sir. Uh, you know, I, I would like to mention a little bit about, you know, on the enlisted side of the house, one of the things that we've been doing from a, uh, I guess you say a kachi cop, she dies out of the house, you know, which we say out here a lot is, you know, uh, we go together. Uh, we, we have done a, a lot of things, you know, the flying squadron, do a lot of buddy squadron type stuff together. And, and, and that is part of fight tonight. But we also train on the enlisted side of the house. Where we've actually had uh, NCOs from the Rock Ave. Uh, go through our Airman Leadership School here on the peninsula, uh, which they they are in high demand, and their Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force actually personally vets every NCO that goes through our Airman Leadership School. So uh, we have another class coming up soon. We graduated one last year, which was a very big highlight of, of my time here, and uh, that will be a normal thing that we're going to continue doing here as we go forward, uh, as we continue to maintain the armistice and fight COVID-19. Sir? Yeah, the the, one of the one of the things I, I know we're probably going to get some questions on a little bit later is you know how how is COVID nineteen affecting our our ability to, to to maintain our readiness our ability to maintain our our training and our sharp edge and, and the answer is uh, it really hasn't affected us right um, because of you know uh, the challenge from uh, our chief of staff uh, to accelerate change or lose right our airmen as they always are and our guardians now are innovative like you read about. And, and they come up with just great ways of solving problems, uh, whether that's a, a training and a readiness issue uh, or whether that's just a quality of life issue here uh, in the peninsula. That's right. Uh, I, I, you know, one of the examples that we've got is a system called uh, ATAX. Uh, it's the uh, Automated Tactical Targeting uh, and Counterfire Kill Chain System. It's a, it's, a, it's a homegrown kind of an effort that was built up uh, by our folks here on the peninsula and it, what it does is it allows us to put uh, almost instantaneous targeting data into the cockpit of our jets using our legacy uh, link systems uh, and, data, and, and data exchange systems. And that idea right there is one of those things that, you know, we put uh, airmen uh, and other folks that have a, you know, a passion to try and make things better, and they just go out and make things happen. And th those are the kind of systems that we're looking at today to try and solve the problem of the threat from uh, from North Korea, uh, you know. Additionally, and I know you all are very familiar with uh, you know Kessel Run, and and the great work that they've done on behalf of the United States Air Force to bring that whole new way of thinking about data, the whole new way of thinking about software, and, and a whole new way of procuring it uh, into our AOCs. Uh, the 607th AOC is uh, you know a fight tonight kind of a facility. On a day-to-day -day basis, you know we've got Rockaf. Uh, and United States Air Force 
uh, airmen and guardians sitting side by side, 24 hours a day, ready to build an ATO if we need to take that fight north. And those folks in there have been, you know, working with a, a fairly antiquated system for a long time. And Kessel Run has now stepped to the plate and really helped out not just the Korean AOC, but, you know, all the AOCs across the planet. And I think from a from an industry standpoint, you know, the the model that we used with uh, Kessel Run, that agile ability to build software on the go, to provide a min viable product, to kick it out the door and hand it to actual war fighters, then provide feedback and get it fixed and keep that OODA loop going. Yeah. That's exactly what's happening today here on the Korean Peninsula. Yeah, it's pretty pretty impressive. Uh, you know, I, I would like to kind of uh, jump on part of the uh, what the commander was talking about with our guardians. Uh, so we, we just yesterday, so uh, you know, hot, hot off the presses, you know, we we were about to talk about seven uh, guardians on the peninsula. Now we have eight, uh, and the first one is the Wolf Pack. And so uh, if you get an opportunity to go out to the Kunsan uh, Air Base uh, Facebook page, you can see a nice, great video uh, of a staff sergeant transitioning into the uh, Space Force. Now that we have a new uh, space uh, enlisted uh, ranks, he must be a sergeant now, I guess, right? Yep. Yeah, so he, an Air Force staff sergeant converted over to be a, uh, a Guardian sergeant. So uh, very impressive that we, uh, that we get to kind of be part of history over here. Um, so now we have eight Guardians on the peninsula. You know, we also have the opportunity to serve with the, the senior uh, guardian, uh, the lieutenant colonel that runs the, uh, uh, is, the is the DER Space Force mm -hmm. uh, that, that gets to brief uh, us up and uh, and also be on the front lines providing, you know, uh, information about how the guardians are really integrating in. You know, they sit on our, our AOC floor, but they also uh, work a lot with our Korean partners. Uh, so much so that, you know, the, uh, the chief of space operations has signed some agreements with the the rock app and its space capabilities to actually be one of the, one of the very first nations to actually have a memorandum of understanding between the uh, between our U.S. Space Force and the uh, space operations under the U.S. Uh, rock app side of the house. So it's very impressive what they're doing as far as integrating. Uh, and some of you folks that are some OSAN alum may remember kind of going out the Doolittle Gate, the backside now, which that go gate is gone now, is called the Morin Gate. But on the, on the hillside up there was the 18th Intel Squadron Detachment. We have deactivated that and stood up the 73rd Intel Squadron, which is now under the Space Force. So so Space Force actually has some ground that they're claiming out here <laughs> on OSAN. But very impressive. Uh, and we look forward to watching as the Space Force grows uh, because they're definitely a force multiplier over here on the Korean uh, Peninsula, sir. Yeah. you know, And one of the other things that I, I don't think can be lost in this conversation is the United States was the first uh, you know, first country to stand up its own space force. Yep. Um, and everybody's watching. They are. Um, you know, now that we have our guardians, uh, you know, with their U.S. Space Force uniforms on, sitting now in the AOC and actually, you know, doing the kind of job that they were asked to do, yeah. our our Rock AF folks are watching that and they are eager and, and they're, they're really thirsty to try and find out yep. exactly how we're doing it what they're going to do and how they can get involved because they understand, you know, the meaning of what space and the space domain brings to us. Yeah, I, I would say that, you know, the Air Force has done a great job of shepherding uh, space uh, as an air and space power for years and years. And the time was right. Secretary Barrett said that it was now is now is the time uh, we have a chief of space operations, chief of staff of space operations. Now uh, we have our own service. Uh, they have their own service now under the Guardians. And I just think that this is a, I mean, it's a really a great time for our entire military when you, when you get to stand up a brand yeah. new, a brand new service. Super exciting. I mean, you know, I, I'm, it's almost probably what a lot of us felt like in 1947. We weren't that old. We were not, <laughs> we were not that old. There may be some out there in listening land that were, but, uh, you know, just thinking back, you know, I'm a historian by, you know, by, by training, I, I am just so excited just to be around these, these eight guardians we have here on the peninsula and just get, kind of get their feeling. Uh, there's a there's a lot of excitement about what space brings to the fight and, and being part of something that's so new, sir. Yeah. You, you know, one of the things that that space does bring to the fight, right, is obviously, uh, you know, uh, precision navigation and timing. Absolutely. Uh, and one of the things that we get asked a lot here in uh, in the Korean Peninsula is, you know, what is our idea of ACE? Um, you know, agile right. combat employment, you know, the the PACAF and, and USAFE and big air forces come out with, you know, lots of ideas and 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 frankly, some really good mutually and shared understanding of what ACE means. 
Korea is a little bit different, if you remember, right? We, we fight from our base. We don't go anywhere. Right. Uh, and all we do is we just bring forces into the peninsula uh, if required, and then they, they bed down. So we don't fight an ace-style fight on a, uh, the way that I think you would normally think about it. However, we also take advantage of ace-like capabilities. Yep. Eighth Fighter Wing has done a great job of basically what they're calling a, a weapon system, Kunsan. Yeah. And what they've done there is they've kind of integrated the the rock app that are there, the army that's there, the Corps of Engineers that are there, the contracting unit that's there, and obviously the Wolf Pack itself. And they they fight the base all together. And and I know from you know my like my time when I was Wolf uh, back in 2011 and 2012. The, the rock AF kind of did what they wanted to do. The Army Corps of Engineers did what they wanted to do. The Army did what they wanted to do. And the 8th Fighter Wing did what they wanted to do. And they've really done a good job of yeah. integrating those, all those desperate capabilities, providing them together. And that, I mean, almost that is a definition of JADC2. Right. What I like about it, too, is that, which is nothing foreign for us on the Korean Peninsula, is, is, is what General Brown used to talk about was multi-capable airmen as mm -hmm. well. Uh, it, it's something we do a lot. And I, I can use my own, uh, you know, uh, training, if you will. When I first got over here, I actually got trained on how to build uh, drop tanks for the Viper. Uh, now, I don't have a whole lot of skill <laughs> anymore, uh, but, uh, but you know, they actually took me out and trained me on how to do this. And if you know, if you're thinking about the air war that, that could happen over here on the Korean Peninsula, you need to build a lot of drop tanks uh, to get, get into the fight and stay in the fight. And so it, you just can't have just a certain amount of maintenance airmen out there doing that. So we did that. Uh, we trained a lot of folks, very similarly to how we do kind of our security forces augmentation. Everybody it takes to defend the base. And so I think part of the thing was so great about multi-capable airmen under the ACE concept um, is that we are just naturally do that on a daily basis over here on the Korean Peninsula within 7th Air Force. Yeah, you know, the, the, the slogan again, you know, fight tonight, right? Well, if, if I got to fight tonight, I fight with who I got. That's right. Um, I, nobody's going to be, nobody's coming, uh, you know, it'll be a few days before I get anybody that's going to join me. And so we got to be able to fight tonight. And that multi-capable airman idea really is, it's, uh, it's just kind of part of the Korean culture, right? It's just, yeah. you got to do what you got to do. And we owe it to our airmen and our guardians that they get the right training that they need before they have to do that. Um, and as you do remember, for those that have been here, we exercise a lot. Uh, you know, our readiness is is something that we are absolutely laser focused on. And we want to make sure with the rotational fo forces that we've got that come in and leave, and then the folks on their one-year tours, that everybody is is really razor sharp and ready to go at any one time. So we get a lot of chance to practice it over here. Yeah. Uh, and the good news is, is our airmen step up to the task each and every time. Um, and part of that, I think, has to do with, you know, really Korea's kind of come a a, a bit of a of an assignment of choice it has yeah uh you know we've again back in the day it, it may not have been the you know the one of the greatest places to bring you and your family but you know we've done a lot of things here in korea some of the things if you're not aware of it um you can now do a uh, dual spouse uh, so two military folks can go to kunsan together yep. if you remember in the old days it one person would have had to go to kunsan one would go to osan but we've authorized that we authorize the same thing here at osan We've uh, expanded the number of, uh, of billets that allow you to bring your families with you. Right. So we've, we've increased that number so more people can bring their families if they'd like. Uh, we've also done some things on the pen, like uh, remove a curfew, uh, which was something that kind of hung over the top of everybody's <laughs> heads for a long time. Uh, and then, what, what, you know, a challenge for, I think, for everybody in the Air Force is we are working really hard to make sure that we divest of infrastructure we don't need, yeah. and we invest in infrastructure that we do need. Absolutely. And we we work hand in hand with uh, U.S. Forces Korea, and as well as the ROC government for ability to utilize some monies that come uh, to allow us to build, you know, some some facilities on our on our bases that we both combine money together so that we can produce a brand new a brand new facility, whether that's a brand new AOC. Uh, or a new dining facility down at Kunsa. Yeah, and uh, you know, part of that too is that I, I kind of call it like adulting, if you will. And over here, if you've been to Korea before, and this is, you know, for me is, you know, going into year seven for me during my career over here. And 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 so, you know, uh, the, the general and I were over here at the same time. I was a senior airman. He was a captain down the Pantons back in the day, uh, down at the Wolf Pack. And I was up here at Osan. 
Uh, and, and it wasn't what I would call extreme adulting back then. It was a curfew in place. You know, there were there was very hard limits on where you could go, what you could do. Uh, but, you know, we, we recruit the absolute very best out of the American population. So, you know, part of that is, is that when you come to Korea, like the general said, we want you to know that we value you for your talents and, to, and also helps retain you as well. So one of the things that we're looking at part of the assignment of choice, that that divestiture of dormitories, which are this is the largest dormitory complex on Osan outside of basic training. Uh, so if you get rid of some of those old dorms, quit putting taxpayer dollars into things that are just, you know, basically band-aid uh, band for these buildings and allow you to live off installation. And, and Korea is, is certainly not a third world country anymore. Back in the day, you might've thought that lining up, you know, use your AT&T calling card to call back and talk to mom and dad. It is, it is the ninth largest economy in the world. It's a beautiful country. Uh, you won't find any more gracious hosts out there and the facilities they allow our airmen to live in fully furnished right outside the gate are absolutely gorgeous uh, so i'll tell you i know it sounds like a recruiting drive to bring people into seventh air force and maybe it is but uh i'll tell you if, you, if you're thinking about doing something different in your career uh, look at what Korea has to offer. We'd love to have anybody that's interested about that come on the team. So. Yeah, that, that was a good recruiting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if anybody out there is on the Zoom call that wants to rejoin the Air Force or become a guardian, <laughs> y'all y- y- just go to phil philhudson.com. <laughs> that's right. Uh, you'll, be, you'll be the next person to get in. Uh, you, know, you know, like 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 the chief said, you know, for a lot of people, I think they still I think there's still a little bit of a, yeah. you know, Korea used to be. Yeah. And I'm here to tell you it's not. Um, it is the most connected oh. country on the planet. Uh, there is absolutely really nothing that you can want for from a Western standpoint over here. Agreed. Uh, and then, uh, you know, the, the towns and the cities are have really embraced the relationship that we have off and on base and off and on post. Yeah. Uh, and you have a majority of folks living on the economy and, and they absolutely love it. And the, the Korean culture is one of just absolute graciousness. Yeah. Uh, and. And they, there's no, there's no fear of traveling around, uh, you know, in Korea, uh, either by yourself or even if you're very limited in Korean, in, in the Korean Hangul language. Yeah. Uh, almost everything and almost everybody speaks English. So it's a great, it is a great place to be. The other thing that I think, you know, that we are, we have the capability to do over here, is to really kind of truly focus be, because of the airmen and the guardians we have on uh, diversity and inclusion. Yeah, I mean, I, I tell you, I think we're probably ground zero for some DNI initiatives that that really made its way into the Department of the Air Force as well. Uh, and, and I will brag a little bit on Seventh Air Force here with General Ploys and uh, and General Willsbach sitting at PACAF. And and prior to that, when General Brown was the PACAF commander, uh, we we put forward some initiatives here to really get after what we felt DNI from a warfighter perspective was about. Uh, from simple things of last September of of General Ploys and I, you know, putting in our desires to the Women's Initiative team. Uh, and thank you for allowing us to to comment on that through the memorandum about what it means to be a female warfighter over here in Korea. Uh, and I'm glad to see that the, that the uh, that the chief adopted some of those uh, initiatives we were asking for, or even down to just having conversations, hard conversations uh, that matter uh, to, to our airmen and allowing them, their voice to kind of guide where we you know, take take the helm of Seventh Air Force. Uh, absolutely, very impressive. Uh, as well as we're redacting a lot of uh, personal identifier information when it comes down to quarterly awards, step promotions, and things like that that started here in Seventh Air Force. That got, that kind of caught up with wildfire up the pack out, and now it's spread across the Air Force, sir. So I'm very proud of that. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's it, it's interesting, right? Um, and I don't think anybody would disagree with this. If you just close your mouth and open your ears, you'd be surprised what your airmen and guardians will tell you. Amen. I agree. And it was a small group session uh, that we were having with the folks down at Kunsan, and they said, hey, you know, we think or there is a perception that when your senior uh, enlisted and your senior officers are looking at awards packages, mm-hmm. that they recognize a name on a package and they score that differently yep. than they would if they don't know the name or if somebody has an unconscious bias against a male or a female or a certain race based on the way the name is that we think that 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 there's a perception out there and so chief and i kind of sat down and and we said is there something that we can do about it you know hey just homegrown right it's just seventh air force it's what we wanted to do 
And so we redacted all that information. We took all gender specific pronouns out of uh, all of our award packages, yeah. uh, senior airmen below the zone, um, all the annual and quarterly award packages as well. Yeah. And then we also redacted the names. And what we ended up doing was we, we provide that only to the recorder for the for the event, whether that's a quarterly award, a senior and below the zone, whatever it happens to be. And then they pass those out and to the senior raters that are rating them, it's record one, record two, record three, record four. And right. never the names come back until after the scoring is completed. That's right. And then we 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 then announce, you know, who who the winners are. But that was a one hundred percent grassroots initiative that came from uh, you know, our captain led uh, and senior NCO led yeah. DNI councils that we have. I mean, we have a total of four DNI councils here on the pen. Exactly. And most people only think, you know, we just have Osan and Kunsan, but we've actually got four of them uh, to include a couple of our uh, uh, of our co located operating bases. Yeah, it's very impressive. I, what I like about it is a flat organization, and and so they they have direct access, you know, to General Ploys. Uh, and, and they leverage that access a lot, which is very impressive. I, I like that they go straight in uh, because all the great ideas and the innovation, as we know, occurs down at the grassroots level. Uh, it just takes leaders that are willing to take some risk to do things differently. And, and that's why I'm very proud to be on this team over here uh, at 7th Air Force, because we absolutely take risks where it matters. And, and so I think, you know, D&I part of that, we've seen the grassroots and it's, like I said, it's grown, sir. Uh, General Wilsbach adopted almost verbatim what we've done here at 7th Air Force uh, across the Pacific Theater. Uh, and so, of course, there's some bits and starts because it takes a lot to redact mm -hmm. because we'd like to get very personal when it comes to writing awards. Your decorations also have gender specific pronouns in there about himself, herself. So there's a lot of redacting, but but people get really good at Adobe redact tool, sir. Yep, yep. And, and it works really well. But I'm very proud of this initiative. And I think our airmen down in the grassroots levels and our DNI councils give us a thumbs up on this initiative and hopefully it'll take off across the air force as well yeah the the last thing i'd say is uh you know a lot of the things that that um we have done starting with that and and kind of continuing on through you know uh, town halls yep. uh we do a, we've done a series of videos uh here in seventh air force we spoke a foreign language in public right <laughs> little maybe there was a little bit of a risk in that one uh but the the, uh, the whole thing is that we are just enablers, right? We don't come up with the ideas that, you know, uh, I'm a 53 year old man, uh, and 50 year old dude. <laughs> and, and I, I am not, I don't know necessarily what our young airmen want to hear. Right. And so we, we lean on our DNI councils to provide that information to us. And then they come up with the ideas. I, we surely didn't come up with the ideas for the videos that we've done no. and some of the topics that we wanted to talk about. And then we let them basically script it and then they shoot it and then they play it back to us and yeah we're a little embarrassed but it, that's okay it, but it's fun they, they they get a kick out of it yeah and, and we're just we're real proud of our airmen and, and if you haven't figured out out of all of this right uh the two biggest cheerleaders on the planet are are, are phil hudson and, and scott Boyce. yeah uh, we love our airmen uh we love everything about them uh what they do every day is super special uh what they do is uh you know to strengthen our alliance uh, the, what they do to make sure that they're ready to fight tonight, um, what they do to make sure that we take care of their families. Uh, what we've done with COVID yeah. is really, a, a, it's the gold standard for the for, for really the entire world, the way Korea has been able to uh, stamp out this virus. If you haven't seen the hashtag kill the virus t-shirts, they're <laughs> alive and well all over the Korean peninsula. Yeah. Uh, we take this stuff pretty seriously over here. But um, I guess in summary, Orville, I, I would say that, you know, Korea is not it's 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 not your father's old mobile yep. it's one of the best places on the planet to serve uh and we're real excited about an opportunity to talk with you and we'll take some questions if somebody has some real nice softball questions for two old men we'd appreciate it <laughs> we can we can take care of that i will tell you that looking at the chat uh there is a whole bunch of airmen for life that would come back and sit there with you and hopefully get a sortie or two in tonight uh so you've got a, a whole set of a uh, if you will, an alumni organization that, that's ready to, to be right there with you. Right. So let me let me just start a bit. Um, Blenda Novotny uh, dialed in with a good question. Uh, a lot of us with Korea um, and PACAP experience here in Washington, for sure, uh, if not across the country, um, there is sort of a, a tendency to not look at the, the real challenges 
the threats on the peninsula. So could you talk just a little bit, sort of reaffirm how you see the tensions in the region, but add on to that the reality of the great relationships you have uh, as military leaders, U.S. military leaders, with your Korean counterparts, um, civilian and military. Chief? Yeah, so so uh, what's unique about Korea, you know, you, you think figure right, you got 51 million people crammed into a place about the size of Indiana, right? So mm-hmm. so you you're you're up close and personal, not only physically, but also mission related and and, and the whole of government. Uh what, what I like about it is that you know, we uh, prior to his departure, we we used to see our US ambassador career, you know, former Admiral Harris, Ambassador Harris, uh, quite often just on and off the installation. And to get guidance that way, to include also the, the MINDEF, uh, the Korean MINDEF, uh, as well as the as the MOFA, uh, the, basically their Secretary of State equivalent. We've actually flew her in the back one of our D model Vipers here uh, off of Osan. So if that doesn't kind of tell you the relationship wise that we we allow our airmen and literally their sex state equivalent set with our airmen and guardians and took their questions about their what they thought about the relationships on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, and actually turned around and did a press briefing right after that with the Korean press to say that she was impressed with the young people that were assigned to Korea, the young airmen and guardians assigned to Korea. So that that kind of just a scene setter about how important and how much the Koreans value our um, relationship from their side of the house as well. Yeah, the the you know from a from kind of a threat standpoint. The, I think what, what makes the, the alliance so great is the fact that we train together each yes. and every day. Yep. As I mentioned, you know, like in the AOC, they literally sit shoulder to shoulder with their Korean counterparts. Yep. Uh, and from a from one of the hats that I get to wear and the deputy commander of U.S. Forces Korea, yeah. uh, working with General Abrams and, and, and from his from his, you know, multi hat, uh, the CFC commander, the UNC commander, uh, you know, USFK commander. And the relationship that he has with their their chairman of the joint of their joint chiefs of staff, right. uh, his relationship with the MINDEF, uh, his, his relationship with MOFA, it it just I think reaffirms the fact that everybody understands that there is a threat to the north. Yeah. And the one thing that we have been able to do numerous times through through lots of the training that we've been able to do, even under COVID con- considerations, is that we walk away every single time and we go there is a threat to the north but we can counter it yep. we are i i'm I've, i have a hundred percent confidence in the fact that we are ready and that we are capable of deterring a threat to the north um there's been lots of open press about you know what's happened on some of the new uh threats that uh north korea has rolled out in a couple of their parades and and my answer back to that everybody says well what do you think about it my answer is we are ready tonight to defend the the Republic of Korea and our allies in the area, uh, if North Korea decides to do something which is uh, unprecedented for them to do, uh, which would be to threaten uh, our country and the sovereignty of the South Koreans. Yeah. Terrific. Thanks. Uh, great response. Uh, Kim Strother uh, just raised his hand, and for all for everyone out there, uh, please use the hand uh, raise hand function. Uh, raise the hand button, and I'll try to get in as many folks as possible. After Tim uh, uh, has his question, comes up, boys, uh, we'll go to Jennifer Oprah Horry from Air Force Magazine. Hey, General, uh, how do you hear me? Uh, loud and clear. Hey, sir, thanks for you and for the Chief's enthusiasm and the leadership. Um, you, you discussed this is your third time uh, um, on The Rock. Could you talk about how you've seen interoperability um, to uh, um, and how that's improved uh, to def- to uh, be able to defend the rock and, and to reinforce some of the issues you've already discussed. Hey, thanks, Bounce. Uh, and by the way, thank you for the question uh, and all your support of the folks over here. Uh, one of the things I think, you know, when I was back here in 1996, interoperability was done probably in the brief and the debrief. Yeah. Uh, when I came over and I was Wolf from 2011 to 2012, interoperability was done uh, via the radio, uh, you know, on an airborne platform. And now that we're here, it's, it's automated. You know, we use Link 16 as the standard amongst uh, all of our airplanes. Uh, I mentioned that ATAX system, uh, another unbelievable, uh, you know, machine learning kind of a capability that gets targets right into the cockpit, not five or 10 minutes of people talking or doing Merc chat back and forth with each other. It's instantaneous 
uh, from the shooter right into the cockpit right there. And so we've got eyes on targets. We have capabilities of taking down targets as fast as possible. And I think probably from that standpoint, that is really where we've moved forward. The last thing I bring in is, you know, the, the Koreans have got, you know, uh, 20 of their uh, F-35s uh, on pen right now. And that F-35, in a few years, there's going to be 224 F-35s in the, in the Pacific theater. Uh, and of that, you know, you're going to have a whole bunch of them right here on Penn with a bunch of them in, uh, with our allies right around. And then the U.S. is going to be uh, with Eielson now uh, accepting their F-35s up at uh, Fairbanks, Alaska. That is going to be the game changer of all game changers. Uh, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of the F-35. Uh, had the unbelievable opportunity to fly that amazing airplane. And I know firsthand what it will bring to this fight. And the fact that the Koreans have got it here and they're training with it today is only going to take that next step, which is an ability for uh, automated machine to machine information being passed back and forth to each other to take interoperability to a level that I think we have never seen before in the Pacific theater. Yeah, I think also, too, I would like to highlight some of the ground side of that, too, because we, you know, our, our JTACs over here are doing a really good job of, of, of training up uh, their JTACs and make them internationally qualified so they can actually do controls and do CAS uh, with U.S. as well as ROCAP aircraft. So it should be seamless whenever, whatever, whatever, no matter what tail comes into country for the fight, it shouldn't matter what's JTACs on the other end of the radio either. Uh, so that's the level of training. Uh, that it's gotten significantly better over the last few years for interoperability from, from the ground side. Yeah, the last thing I'd throw in there is that some of the stuff from Kessel Run yeah. is automated, a bunch of things on the on the AOC floor. Yeah. So, you know, things that used to come in by voice, you'd have to transcribe it, you'd put it into chat, yeah. and then they would put it into another chat, and then they'd go to a, a different classification and bring it into another chat. Chances of, you know, of, of transposing numbers or, or target coordinates yeah. uh, are, are pretty high because it's a human to human. Uh, we've we've uh, we've removed a bunch of that kind of stuff and we'll continue as we continue to move forward with, uh, you know, the modernization of our AOC. Sure. Response said uh, Jennifer uh, from Air Force Magazine, Jen Jennifer Oprahori, do you have a, a question? Yes, I do. Thank you all so much for taking the time today. Um, so I really appreciated your discussion of the diversity and inclusion initiatives you've been undertaking. And while 7th Air Force is literally an ocean away from Washington, I was just hoping that you might be able to comment on how uh, you both are addressing the Joint Chiefs call for unity in the midst of the events of January 6th. And what if any conversations um, or steps that you're taking to ensure that troops know that there's no place for extremism within the numbered Air Force's ranks? Thank you. Hey, thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, and, and it's a great question. Um, I, before I get actually to answering exactly your question, I'm, I'm gonna go back a little bit. Uh, when you go back to uh, the, the murder of uh, George Floyd, yeah. um, you know, we mentioned the tensions are, can be pretty high here on the on the Korean Peninsula, and uh, General Abrams, uh, USFK commander at the time, said, "Hey, we are not immune just because we're not in the country from this kind of discourse causing a problem or a undercurrent uh, to our readiness, to our morale, and to the fabric of our military culture." Mm -hmm. And he worked with all the way back to Washington for a capability for us to utilize military facilities to hold a protest. Yep. That was unheard of. Uh, and, and, and as far as I know, I think it's the only place it's ever been done before. We're on yep. a military installation. We authorize people to, to hold a peaceful protest. And so from the very beginning here in 7th Air Force and in and U.S. Forces Korea, General Abrams has, has made it absolutely clear that our American citizens have the right to publicly discourse with what is going on, and more importantly, that they have the ability through, in this case, him asking and getting permission and then authorizing that ability to do that as a common standard procedure here in, in, in the Korean Peninsula. I bring that back because I don't think necessarily a lot of people know that story. Yeah, they don't. The, so now fast forward to today. People in people here are watching just like people all across the world, right? So for all of us that are, you know, deployed, whether we're PCS or we're actually, you know, in a deployed status, 
what happens in the United States affects us because that's where our families are. That's where our hearts are. That's, that's the flag we wear. That is the flag we gave an oath to. And when you see something like that, where you see extremism is uh, not only incompatible with our service, it goes against our moral fabric. It does. You know, what I, what I like about, and we talk about, the, you know, George Floyd's uh, murder and some of the, the, um, the peaceful protesting that happened, it happened here on Osan. We actually did it here, which was, was very exciting uh, and solemn to see at the same time. What I like about what we have done, uh, there has been a lot of discussions down in our private organizations uh, to include our AFA chapter here about what January 6th means to you personally. Um, what, what I think that we would kind of want to send back, you know, across the ocean, Jennifer, is that what right looks like is that this is how adults have civil uh, discourse. This is also how adults have civil debate with each other. Uh, I'm very, very proud of our airmen, our guardians over here. Uh, I said I have sat in rooms several times to where folks uh, were on each side of kind of like the same message. We just had different words to describe it. But as long as you know that, you know, we all we all over here for the same reason. One is for fight tonight and defend, the, defend South Korea, our, our, our partners, but also to represent America and the very best of America uh, forward in a, in a foreign country. And, and I think what I love so much about is our airmen and guardians. Do not forget that. And I think it goes back to our core values uh, and how we espouse those and how we demonstrate those, not only uh, to the to the host nation, but also to each other. So uh, very impressed with, with how things have, have kind of flowed over here in Korea, especially within 7th Air Force. I tell you what, listen to the two of you, there's no doubt uh, we select uh, in a, certainly in a meritocracy, our, our, our best leaders to lead. Uh, that's a... You know, you inspire me in a way, and all of us, in, in how um, you're focusing on the mission and the higher calling of the mission while addressing the real issues around diversity and inclusion. I, I can't thank you enough. We have time for one more question. What, what I'd like to just close out with is, could you talk just a bit, uh, both of you, about um, how 7th Air Force, uh, as the air component uh, for U.S. Forces Korea, along with the uh, U.S. Forces Japan and 5th Air Force really work together. Uh, there's a notion that uh, Japan and Japanese militaries and the Korean militaries don't necessarily work together, but in fact, uh, and Rose, you already talked about, there's an ally there, and there's certainly a relationship between 5th and 7th Commander U.S. Forces Korea and Commander U.S. Forces Japan. So if you just close out with that, how uh, you're continuing to strengthen the deterrent message, the credibility of your deterrence in the region, again, we can't thank you enough, and then we'll shift to a smaller group. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Um, you know, so when, when you think about it, um, I'm on Penn, right. And, and Japan is just not that far South. Yeah. Right. And so, uh, they are within the threat rings of North Korea as well. And so we have a mutual, uh, we have a mutual threat to the North. Um, and I think that, that, you know, when you look back on the, 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 uh, the, the fifth and seventh air force, uh, conversation, you know, we all, I need them, they need us to make sure that we are deterrent against North Korea because anything that happens on the pen, it, you know, they have all the capabilities, North Korea has all the capabilities of trying to trying to bring uh, Japan into this fight as well. And I think, you know, from a fifth Air Force standpoint, General Schneider uh, and I, uh, all, all the way through, you know, PACAF and 11th Air Force, uh, all the way up in Alaska, right? We're all part of that PACAF force that's really going to be the, the folks that come in here and defend the, the peninsula. Uh, we're the first ones to be here. Obviously, we're here tonight. Japan's here tonight. Those are my fight tonight forces. Uh, and the rest of them are all going to have to come in with, you know, tanker support, uh, lots of help from our guardians to get them across the ocean safely. Uh, yep. But the whole idea here is that, you know, inside of the, the threat ring that is, uh, you know, North Korea, You've got two folks from a 5th Air Force and a 7th Air Force who are keenly focused on making sure that our alliance stays together. Uh, and I can also tell you from a, from a military standpoint, the relationship that I have with my ROC counterparts, the relationship that we have with the, the JASDAF forces and the Koko Jatai, those folks, that is, that is a tight relationship, right, from a military yes. standpoint, right? Yes. We're all military folks and we know how to get along. I mean, to include, you know, uh, when, when Chief Master on the Air Force Wright was uh, was in office, uh, we took the uh, JASDAF uh, Chief Master on the Air Force, the ROCAF Chief Master on the Air Force, 
We took them up to Alaska, met up there together, put them out there on the uh, on the iceberg, and, and 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 the relationships that they built when you're out there in the cold together <laughs> uh, pays huge dividends when you come back and you start discussing things, you know, about wh what your position is, you know, uh, as far as how your your Air Force fights. Uh, I also like the talent management, you know, in general, right? You kind of alluded a bit a bit to that, but uh, on the U.S. Air Force side of the house, we do a really good job of of flowing folks in and out of fifth and seventh and back and forth across, you know, the Yellow Sea or the East Sea, depending on what side of the uh, of the uh, sea you're on. And so there's a lot of folks over in Fifth Air Force that are Seventh Air Force alum and vice versa. So that relationships goes back decades and it makes it really smooth to actually have uh, interoperability between the two NAFs. Yeah, the last thing I bring up just real quick is that, you know, COVID-19 is a, uh, a global threat. It is. Um, and, and it's a and it's a big threat. Um, and we've worked really closely with, uh, you know, all of PACAF, but specifically with Fifth Air Force to make sure that we were aligned from a military standpoint, that our readiness uh, was not going to be affected. Uh, you know, we, we did not want the virus to get inside of our formations because as soon as that happens, it affects our readiness. And the, the, the airmen, the guardians on both uh, Japan and Korea have really done a monumental effort to make sure that it does not affect our ability to fight tonight. Yeah. Well, thank you so much uh, for all of us as we ship to a smaller group here. We cannot thank you enough for what you're doing, the opportunity to interact tonight, and we're on your wing. Uh, I think uh, I speak for everybody on the net tonight. So, so thanks again for your leadership and, and just, you know, you, you fired us up. I guarantee I speak for all of us. Uh, what an exciting time uh, for us to be with you tonight. Uh, and just, just thanks for your inspiration. So we'll share. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Orville.